conscious contact to a power greater than you. Now, I get it. I totally understand that, you know, even in your industry, right? So let's say you're the leadership or the training or whatever, the coaching training, where there is a level of, oh, no, we're intellectual. We are not allowed to play in the mystical. I've had people's eyebrows go up in this new thing. I joined Transformational Leadership Council, and I get it. It's not for everybody, but I could care less. I know what's true, and I don't need anybody to believe in something that just is. Air is air. You don't see it, but that doesn't mean it's not there. For me, there is a level of needing to control the narrative that's still steeped in the old concept of we are the ones, you don't get to do it. And I teach every single human being has the right to access this. Welcome to the Mind Tracks podcast with breakthrough ideas to live your best life possible and how to make it happen. I'm Paul Sheely, and today we'll be talking with Colette Baron Reed. Colette Baron Reed is an internationally acclaimed oracle expert, spiritual medium, and author of seven books published in 27 languages. She is the founder of the Oracle School and author of 15 best selling oracle card decks with over a million sold. Her greatest joy is teaching people they can have a direct and personal dialogue with the universe to help them to create their most fulfilling lives. Colette also hosts the podcast Inside the Wooniverse, and her TV show Messages from Spirit can be seen on Amazon Prime and YouTube. Hello, Colette. Welcome to the Mind Tracks podcast. So good to be with you. You too. And can I just say your sartorial choice of silk fabulosity from China is something that I covet in this moment and would wear. (laughs) Thank you so much. Well, looking at some of the photos of you, you're just so bohemian. I just love your look. I love your whole vibe. And so I thought, I'm going to change out of my jacket. I'm putting on my silk. I I don't do this for anyone else but you. Yes, I am the boho queen. I will say that. That is true. That's so great. Well, yeah, I get it forever. There's something about your vibe that absolutely resonates too. You are openly a mystic, you're openly an oracle, you're openly a psychic, you're openly a spiritual teacher. So I really am have my spiritual life kind of closeted because I came up in the training and development business and, you know, got into the work that I do by way of understanding the mind. And what, what I Mm -hmm. did is I had tremendous spiritual experiences along the way, which have always informed my work. I want to ask you about your big publishing activity, which is around Oracle cards. Historically, the Oracle is an important part of human history. Could you just talk a bit about what is an Oracle and how you came to really identify your work around Oracle? Yeah, perfectly. So um, thank you. Thank you. And thank you for having me. Um, So I'm with Hay House as uh, Hay House is my publisher. And uh, I am known for my work as an Oracle card creator. So I have 15 decks published with two more. uh, So there'll be 17 decks. I'm published in 27 languages and I've sold over a couple of million decks in the past um, since 2005. Right. So why, why do I do this? And by the way, I am a science nerd. So I am a nerd and I am openly mystic. I am a very skeptical person who has seen the evidence. And then I go and talk to all my scientist friends who tell me what the brain science is behind it and the mystical quality and how do we put it together. So I'm very, very much about both and the that where, but I have a natural ability 
um, and always did. And by the way, I went to law school. So, so that was not that, that and oracles don't go together. Um, but I became very obsessed since I was a teenager about oracles because my father who was Serbian and my great grandmother was Mongolian. So she had came over in the 18th century. My dad was born in 1908 and uh, he was the, the youngest of seven uh, and he was a twin. So they were, you know, anyway, so she, they were horse traders and I think they traded her also with a horse. Um, and she became my, 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 oh yeah, like 1800s a Mongolian 15 year old girl. How did she get there? Right. To Serbia, you got to do the math. So, yeah. So uh, the reason I want to bring this up is just people to say like, where did you get this and why, or why, why did you have an interest in this? Considering I came from an academically inclined family, um, who really believed that law school was the way, right. <laughs> so, so, um, yeah. So, uh, my father taught me when I was very young how to read Turkish coffee cups. And he was a very adept at reading the symbols in, in the grinds, right? So that's called tassiomancy. And uh, I only found out when he died, actually, because both my parents died 30 years ago, back to back from his their friends, that my mother had forbade him to do it because he would go into a trance. And, and he one time at a cocktail party, he told this this woman that her husband was having an affair with this other woman. They were both in the back of the room and this whole thing. And it was a big scandal. My dad didn't know what he said. Now he was an engineer and a land developer and whatever, and very academically inclined. He was an inventor and did all kinds of interesting mathematical things and physics and God knows what else. And, but he had this ability. So I know I got it from him, but I was really fascinated by what I saw. And so uh, when he explained what I was looking at. I, I, he, and he told me that there was this animistic quality to life, that there are spirit animals and in Slavic tradition, like ancient pagan Slavic tradition, like they were kind of, it was very interesting in that Eastern Slavic traditions, they kind of stuck Christianity together with the pagan things. So they kind of faked it. <laughs> and and so quite a, a few of the traditions, the more mystical traditions were still there. Um, but also because of what he learned from his grandmother, right? And uh, he used to love telling us that we were direct descendants of Genghis Khan. Um, anyway, so uh, I digress. So the Turkish coffee cups then brought me into reading. Like he had this, this incredible book collection that was written in the early 1900s about all these myths and legends from all these different cultures. And I noticed that in all of the books in every culture, there was a mention of divination or oracles. Everybody had it. So I kind of became obsessed. And this is, I'm like 16, 17. And, uh, you know, and I'm looking into this and I'm reading about augury, you know, the Greeks uh, looking at the oracles of bird formations and scrying. And I'm looking at water divination and I'm reading about, um, well, I didn't like the entrails part. So because people used to do that, too. I was not interested in that disgusting thing. But just really the history of, of culture, like ancient cultures and primitive cultures that we think were primitive, that they all used a form of communication with consciousness. We we will call that consciousness with capital C. Now, other people call it spirit, God, universe, doesn't matter. So if you look at now the um, the manifesto for post-materialist science, now there's this whole thing that everybody's saying that consciousness is fundamental. So you can use science language or leadership language, whatever the heck the language is, but the bottom line is whatever you describe it, it's that. So it's all, it all starts with consciousness. And, yeah. and what's important in the work that you're talking about is that we really do have access to all a pure consciousness, which is always available to inform us about any inquiry we may yes. make. And so the way when I was in college, somebody showed me the uh, A.E. White's deck of tarot yeah. cards. Yeah, that's and how I learned on that. Me too. So I, <laughs> I started doing readings and the moment yeah. I laid them out, I'd get these huge downloads. I mean, I'm getting goosebumps just remembering it. It was so obvious to me. And I yeah. realized, okay, here's a symbol. And all the symbol was attempting to do was give my conscious mind yeah. enough oh, wow. of an opening to allow the non-conscious mind to explain exactly what's going on. And it, 
like with your grandfather, it's a blessing and a curse because sometimes I would say things that I just intuited in the moment that create create a little bit of a ruffle in the room. I can tell you about that story another time. So yeah. please continue. So you were, yeah, you so, were recognizing so, it. So I'm recognizing it in the tools. And so, yeah. so now I, I will say also at the same time, you know, I know you just asked me about oracles, but my journey uh, with that is that I couldn't handle the amount of information coming through. I became a drug mm. addict and an alcoholic, and I got clean and sober when I was 27. Okay, so, so hold, I'm going to pause you right there because yeah. I came in exceedingly sensitive as well. And yeah. so the world to me was way overwhelming. And that's me how too. I found my way to sitting and silencing the mind through meditation. I, I longed for it. The only time I ever found that kind of peace was when I was six years old and I would just pray. And in that prayer state, I would find that peace would just calm me. There were no fears. I was protected. I was okay. So I'm with you on that. It, it's yeah, just and I And so what much. you're talking about, I totally identify with. Now I took an extreme... Uh, express train to that through those years in my 20s. I mean, it was a series of traumatic and violent things and whatever. So, and then when I hit bottom, I'm kind of, I'm very grateful for that because um, I devoted myself to a spiritual path. I got into a meditation practice. I did 90 minutes a day. It became about prayer and meditation. I joined a 12 step program or a number of them. And, um, you know, and I had to surrender the stories and, and, and then short, very quickly, I became reintroduced to the concept of divination because I didn't trust myself in some ways. Um, I had met a therapist uh, and she used the tarot and I was looking at it going, what are you doing? Because I saw the tarot as a fortune telling device or a way in which I could see the future or I could track things but never as a personal development tool until right. she introduced it to me. And that's, that renewed my interest. Okay. In I'm going to, I want to pause in that story for a moment. If, if I can, because I get, I, I'm trying to hang on to the freight train that's moving. I love every minute of it. There are a couple of pieces in here that are super important because right. the word occult and the word pagan in art, Christian dominated society is like satanic. It's like bad right. stuff. It's instantly associated with the bed. And to have your mental model suddenly open to say, wait a minute, this is not a bad thing. I mean, there are groups that say just playing cards because those are actually the tarot cards. Those are divination tools those are bad. You can never play cards, any so, card game. Let me so, tell you something. Let yeah. me just, let me, let me, let me go back to this. So okay. I will speak to this. Occult is a word that means secret or hidden. Pagan represents the earth. Earth-based traditions that have become secret are because of the, well, okay. We look at the 300 years that are crisscrossing the goddess culture and the patriarchal culture from the partnership model of society to the dominator model of society. There became a whole bunch of laws taking women's rights away, their, their, their rights to worship, centralizing worship with a priest that you had to pay where the centralized worship, the temple was in the town. You had to now have a jealous, angry God that was going to be telling you what to do and et cetera, et cetera. Even even the De book of Deuteronomy says very clearly in the Bible that you you should never, you know, practice divination or this or that because you are you have the reason being is because you got to go to the temple and talk to the priest there. This right. was all politics, economics, and <laughs> only only the priest oh. has the right to speak with God. You have yeah, not to speak you. You can't mm, have right exactly. So. I'm totally on board. So 100%. conscious contact to a power greater than you. Now right. I get it. I totally understand that, you know, 
even in your in your industry, right? So let's say you're the leadership or the training or whatever, the coaching training, where there is a level of, oh no, we're intellectual. We are not allowed to play in the mystical. I've had people's eyebrows go up in this new thing. I joined Transformational Leadership Council and I get it. It's not for everybody, but I could care less. I know what's true and I don't need anybody to believe in something that just is. Air is air. You don't see it, but that doesn't mean it's not there. For me, there is a level of needing to control the narrative that's still steeped in the old concept of we have to, we are the ones, you don't get to do it. And I teach every single human being has the right to access this. And not only the content, right, not only the it right, is, uh, but it the is natural us. inclination and connection were it. So yeah, yeah. absolutely. So, so I, I get it. And so, so, so we have, so wait, I want to say yeah. this. So, so <laughs> okay. People have a tendency to take divination and put it in fortune telling, fraud, you know, dial 800. And there is a lot of that. There are people who prey on people's fears because they don't know there's invisible. There's a power dynamic that can be scary, especially if you are raised in an idea that this is bad and whatever. It's so, just to such an extent that to invite children in a classroom to close their eyes, to center their mind before a test is opening them to devil influence. I mean, holy a, no, I don't. Oh my yeah, goodness. But that, yeah. But we there are, are the extremes. I, but there's, there's, there's a time now, this is becoming much more mainstream. You know, I always say I've all, I, I live at the corner of fringe in Maine. You know, and and uh, I love like Dr. Joe Dispenza, whose entire mission is as a scientist is to prove the mystical and to get people there. Um, you know, and my I come from the mystical. I bring in some of the science, and I get people. I, I just tell people have the experience, and then come back and tell me. So why we need it right now, and why oracles are important now, is that we do need to know on an individual basis that we have that conscious contact available to us. And I create products specifically to enable them to do it, nice. right? So the, these are modernized versions of ancient oracles uh, based on a lexicon or a vocabulary of symbols. Now, my background is also now Jungian psychology. I studied Jung. I loved it. I never got my degree. And I, I kept telling Hale, so I didn't finish my degree. They were, they don't care. Right? So, but it's the idea that there's this unconscious, incredible uh, a repository of symbolic language because the soul doesn't speak English or Chinese or Russian or Portuguese. It, it, it speaks pictures. It speaks yes. metaphor. It speaks symbols. And it's right there if we want to talk to it. So today, to, that, to that point, I also want to add that most of us as a result of developing symbolic la language of letters and numbers, we right. give up access to so yes. much of the natural gifts that are within us and it, it, they get marginalized and we lose access to a lot of these powers for boys when they're about 10, for girls when they're about 12, because we are now stepping into the acculturation of the culture that raised us, our family system, our religious institutions, our schools, our, our culture. So the idea is what you're doing is creating enough of an opening that a symbolic language beyond language gets to help you recognize or touch the inner wisdom or the knowing that's trying to reach us at a conscious level. I want to hang out with you more. I know. Let's do it. <laughs> you know, <Come> let's <laughs> do it. <laughs> this is such a great conversation. 1000%. Right. And there are many of us out there. I think the issue is too, like right now, there's so much division in the world. And you think about now it's getting worse before it gets better. I mean, we have been conditioned also because we've been conditioned out of our natural access, cyclical access to time, for example, the cyclical, the, the natural access to nature, all of these things have been conditioned out of us. Now we're being conditioned into sustained uncertainty equals fear equals I'm already cut off because I can't access it because Ooh. my amygdala is running the show. I love so, it. I love it. So, so I want to stay, I want to come back to this idea of fear 
being mongered so that it is the best device for controlling the masses as totally. long as we keep them queued up. And that's why the fear of death became so prevalent in the churches. You know, as soon as we, if we, if nobody fears death, how are we going to be able to control anybody? When you fear death, you could go to hell. Yeah. Now we've got your attention. So yeah, it's super important to move ourselves from fear to the place of trusting and surrendering. And there is, uh, there are, I believe, a series of steps that we need to go through to get there. And I would like you to speak to those steps that you have found in working with the people yeah. that you've worked with. So um, I developed a process uh, called um, the Envision process, which we then renamed the Total Mind Shift process, which is a three minute quick way to move your mind out of the fight flight fawn uh attach a freeze or fight fight freeze fawn attach whatever that is into a state of witnessing observation right so and that's just i've experimented i mean mind tracks has got some stuff in there like i just listened to the anxiety thing the other night you know i'm like oh that was great so it's anything that helps us de disengage from that and you can't think your way through it. You can't feel your way through it either. You have to do something that is a me meditative in, you know, that can help you move your mind. So there's yeah, this, of the idea of upregulating into that prefrontal cortex where we have the God spot, where we have yeah. mind sight. It, it's a very simple, pro I call it dropping in, but the idea is the same. Less than three minutes, you're there. There is no reason why you should get hijacked by your reptilian or your mammalian brain or your neocortex getting overwhelmed. And the fact that there's so much noise and it's so difficult for people to separate the signal from the noise. If we mm -hmm. have noise at 10 and the signal at one, we got one tenth of the access That's to the right. power we have. But if we could put our noise level at 0.5, we got double our access to this power and wisdom that's trying all the time it's to all get the time. It's trying to talk to us. It totally right. is. But I do think, you know, there, there's, there's this whole thing these days about talking about bypassing. Oh, we can't bypass it. And I'm like, yeah, but that's dangerous. It's like acknowledge is not the same thing as diving in and sitting in your dirty diaper. Right. <laughs> it's like, I get it. You know, this is true. This and that is true. So I think right now we need the resilience of being in, two, in this and that, you know, both and. Okay. Right? And third <laughs> space, which is a space that you're helping people enter, is neither this nor that nor both and. It is something absolutely separate from either of those. So while both and will help, it's still keeping, it's like our breath. Our breath has an inhale and an exhale. Inhale is wonderful, but it's not sustainable. Exhale is wonderful, but it's not sustainable. We need them both, but we also need to be able to flow through them in order to get to a higher level expression that we're trying to maintain. So yeah, the, the, the binary thinking, all of that really is a problem of an historical way of saying, this is good, that's not. That's bad, yeah. this is better. And it's all relative. So, but you know, people are not, they have to get there in stages because I don't think you could, what you just said, the average person can't grok that. I mean, they're like, oh yeah, you're just talking BS, right? So it's like, what do you mean? Come on. I'm feeling this. I'm experiencing that. And I'm like, yeah, both. And then what? Like acknowledge them both. Don't run away from one and don't say the other one is good. Now we, can we step up? Let's go one more step and just observe. So part of okay. part of what I think a trap we get into the kind of goal setting trap that says, well, I, I'm just trying to be a better person. And as soon as we step along that, we've forgotten that wait, the pure self, the true self, ever free, ever pure, ever wise, that's consciousness and bliss that thou art. 
That's all there has been. Ancient wisdom traditions for 5,000 years have been trying to teach Even us longer. to humanity. Right. <laughs> so so what, we, what we have the opportunity to do is amidst all of it, <clears throat> whatever noise is going on, is just to pause. Somebody said, practice awareness until spirit emerges. Pause. Oh, I love that. I've never heard that. I know, isn't that great? Practice awareness until until spirit spirit emerges. emerges. So just Mm -hmm. pause in the in the busyness of the mind. Drop in, or as you say, you know, just do that mind shift process. Because what it'll do is it'll just create a wedge in our habit of expectation, our habit of behavior, and that opening is all you need to plug into the main line of, of wisdom that's trying to get to us. And, but here's the other thing too, I think people need to be realistic about, you know, they, I talk about spiritual narcolepsy. We're all going to fall asleep at the wheel at some point and we have to wake ourselves up again. So it's like the expectation that we're always going to be accessing that bliss, that pure (laughs) mind that is, is like not possible because we have our stories. We have our conditioned self. We have society. We just turn on the freaking news for five seconds. Apple news tells me why I should be afraid today. Right. And you know, like and here to find out okay. how. <laughs> You're big. so we 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 have to stay in the 24 hours, do the best we can and strive for that what you're talking about. And and for me, the striving is in the surrendering. So it sounds like You know, it's not work. It's about how much letting go can I do? You know, am I willing to do? And I sometimes I have to pray to be willing to be willing. You know, (laughs) let me be willing to be willing to let go. Let me be willing to let go, right? It's it's, it's what my wife and I say. I really wish I wanted to let go right now. (laughs) (laughs) I don't have to let go. I just really wish I wanted to. Yeah. I wish I wanted to. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) So, So let me ask you about this before we get to surrender, because I really do think that this is the crux of the problem. What I also recognize, and I started doing this with my clients, people would say, Paul, I've got a problem. And I go, yes, because now, now you've identified the place where you're giving away the true power that is within you. It's at that disorienting dilemmas. So celebrate those disorienting dilemmas that show up. You don't have to be spiritually enlightened every moment of the day. When a problem shows up and you really feel stuck, that's the good news. Because now you know where to direct your attention to make a difference. And very often along the spiritual path, I find that there are people that start their healing journey. Like the, the tragedies of your younger years And all of the difficult decisions that you made that ran you into brick walls on an ongoing basis, those were all training grounds. In Jungian psychology, if all you do is seek the light, your dark side is becoming stronger and stronger. The really do need the yin and the yang. But a teacher like you or me, we can't do someone's healing work, but we can create a context in which a healing can occur. In my school. Yeah, please. Sorry, I have a school, Oracle school is my yearly school. It's an eight month program or six months, sorry. Um, And uh, we tell people as they come in the door, first, you're not broken. Second, we're going to teach you how to fish. We're not going to fish for you, barbecue it and cut it up on your plate. We're going to show you how to fish. And then when you come out the other side, you'll be empowered to do this for yourself. And I think that's really key. We don't, that that is an egoistic idea that we have any power whatsoever to, to create healing for someone. What we can do is create an environment, a safe container, flexible container at time with, with boundaries that that would enable that person and give them a system to say, okay, try this, you know, and, and, Yeah, that's why I love you so much, because I really get that that's who you are, that that's what you're presenting to people. And there is real work that we're advocating for. It's we are unaware, as Jung said, back to Jung, he said, how can we know? 
the dragon that swallowed us. We're in the belly of the beast. Us. We're in it. Yeah. We're in the belly of the beast. We don't even know what we don't know. We don't see. We're in a blind spot of being able to see what's really got hold of us. For me, it was in, uh, I became a clinical hypnotherapist at a very young age, back in 1975, while going to the university for biological sciences. And what I realized in one of my very first presentations on stage was, oh my goodness, we're putting ourselves in trances all the time. That's yes. what we need to wake up from. So I became a de-hypnotist. People would come to me for hypnosis. I said, I'll hypnotize you to get the change. Then I'm going to de-hypnotize you so that you know you're the one that is the change agent for all the rest of your life. And this becomes much more generative. It becomes something where a person recognizes that they have agency to continue to improve for all the rest of your lives. And I think your Oracle cards inherently are generative technologies. They're not just, they are. I got to fix this. No, Fine. And it will help. It will help fix because it will give you insight, but you're going to do the fixing within yourself with the wisdom that comes through. Yeah. And, and it's all about not giving your power away to anything yes. outside of yourself. Right. So yes. just like you said, not giving your, your power away to the hypnosis and then saying, Oh, I, I, I got hypnotized. So that means somebody did that to you and whatever, you know, yeah. you have to, you have to be the generative, you have to be the change agent. Otherwise it doesn't stick. So it guess what stick. I, yeah. guess what I did my doctorate in is how does someone transform themselves? I mean, that, that was exactly the thing I wanted to understand. So, so you are a member of the Transformational Leadership Council. You're a transformational leader. You're helping people transform. So where does surrender really come in? First of all, what does it mean? Because from surrender a standpoint of identity, nobody wants to surrender who they are. Well, no, because the ego would then die and it, this entire purpose is to stay alive and make sure it's got some place in your life. So no, um, surrender is not giving up. For me, it's giving it over, right? So into my partnership. So I, I, I subscribe to the notion that we're in partnership with consciousness, that, that, because we see ourselves as separate, it's kind of a construct. That's the only thing that we accept right away that we're in this partnership, even though that consciousness is in us and made us also, right? So, but the idea- Co-creators, co-creators. Exactly right. So that, that's what I teach is co-creation. So we look at the manifestation process, for example, of which has now been hijacked, you know, by the, you know, for many years now and, and very simplified, which the truth is, is that we are powerful co-creators. But the at the form needs to be surrendered. Like, I don't know the form. You listen to my album, for example. My entire career interests for me was music, was re to become a recording artist. Never to do what I do now. This was uh, this was like, I could just do it. I used to tell people the first six years I did reading, I don't really do this. I'm really a singer. Don't come back next year. I won't be here. I'll be on tour or something. And then I ended up like, after about six years with, I realized... I've had people call me from 29 countries, from their countries, long distance. There was no internet. People gave my number out in, in airports and conversations over coffee and stuff. And literally at that point, I realized, why am I trying to quit this? Just a second. <laughs> even though, even though I still had this thing. So, you know, we have this attachment to form. So for me, it's the surrender of the attachment to the form, surrendering my attachments Love it. is most important. And then surrendering the outcome, but staying on for me, you know, following the signs, following my gut, following my intuition, following common sense sometimes, even though common sense may not actually be accurate, but you know what I mean? Just sort of following and knowing that today my commitment will be to, no, to do no harm to the best of my ability, you know, and to follow, because I believe every one of us has a destiny, every single one of us, if we've ever felt an, ins 
inspired moment. That means spirit speaks to us. It's like there is an impulse in us to be creative, an impulse to, to yes, to be better, an impulse to grow and to change and to be part of something and to belong and to love, you know? And so how can I be a channel for that? So for me, surrender is multi-layered. Yeah. You know, it's like being, if I'm a channel- Being fully available. Available, yeah. That's yeah. what surrender is, availability. So in the vernacular I've used through the years, uh, I'm giving up my expectation of how it's supposed to show yes. up, but I maintain a positive expectancy that it will show up or what one of my clients calls a relentless knowing that yes. source is finding the best ways and means for me to realize that high purpose that I'm living this life. thousand for. percent. Okay. I, I love the way you coined that because that's a hundred percent true. You, you, you surrender your expectation of the form of the, yes. and again, because sometimes we can be very attached in that we have to have it that way, our way, the highway, <laughs> whatever way. Right. <laughs> sure. And it's like, no, that's not going to work. But the, but if we do that, then we can be relaxed with that positive expectation, that higher expectation, that source is going to deliver exactly what I need. Sometimes it's going to deliver a, the exact thing. Like my husband and I, how we found this house, this house was hilarious. We might, I, I, we were living in Connecticut at the time and we kept, you know, renting these homes. We, and we were living in the States for 10 years, we're Canadians. And we kept saying, this is the house before the house. This is obviously not the house. It's going to be the house before the house. I said, well, what does the house house look like? What would it be? And I said, well, I know my download on this. What I know I see is that it's 25 acres. It has an artesian well. It has a specific size swimming pool. I want, it's all made of wood. I see that. And, and, uh, and it's an hour and a half outside of a city. And then my husband piped in. He goes, well, what I see and what I feel is that there's a Frank Lloyd architectural build home. And I went, ah, oh, come on. Now you're making it really hard now. So, so I said, okay, whatever. So he goes, no, I'm serious. I feel that's, you know, that's the thing. Three weeks later, we got it because we never sat down and did that exercise. So we put it in a God box and said, okay, let's write it out and put the God box. I said, okay, this is something better. Who cares? Let's go. So let's just keep going. And I said, but you know, I feel like the perfect place is coming. And he goes, yeah, me too. Three weeks later, I get a call from a girlfriend up here in Canada. My husband never wanted to move back to Canada. Uh, I said, I think it's a car. And he goes, oh, California, Connecticut, Colorado, maybe it's a car. All those Frank Lloyd Wright architectural homes, mostly in Connecticut and near in, in upstate New York. So I'm like, they're too expensive. I'd have to sell Milton to gazillions of Oracle cars. <laughs> anyway, so we get a call. There is a country estate owned by that former Royal Bank uh, president. Um, it's not for sale yet, but it's got what, 25 acres. It's got an artesian well. There's a pool. There's this, that, and the other, like all of my little list. And um, <laughs> it's an hour and a half outside of Toronto. And I went, and where it's in Canada. So I didn't want to tell Mark. So I ended up saying, listen, Mark, there's a thing in Canada. <laughs> anyway, so I showed it to him on the thing. And he goes, holy crap. And then the dollar dropped that very week because we could we didn't have the down payment because we were, we were living outside of Canada. And so and then we had all of a sudden we had all the money we needed just like that. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. so I'm like, OK, now I'm not saying that the universe made the dollar drop and that this place. It's just that somehow we touched that dimension of consciousness that matched something that was already there. We forgot to mention that it shouldn't be a fixer upper, but it was it is. <laughs> But we got everything well, that we if you own a Frank Lloyd Wright, you're going to have no. roof problems. No, know? it's a copy. Here's the thing. I, I love the idea of spending the next two hours talking no, about manifestation <laughs> stories. Yes, we can. We can do it. Um, I absolutely manifestation stories are, are my all-time favorite. Me too. And developing an awareness of just how freakingly cool we all are as amazing intuitives, psychic, co-creators, co distant healers, all yeah. of that. It's all available to us. So I want to ask you just a couple more questions because we're sure. going to need to wrap it up. You've done a lot of readings for a lot of people in a lot of countries 
And if you were to just gather up all of those readings and look at what is the one thing or the top ideas that seem to be coming through as the biggest questions that people are facing today. I would love to hear it. And then the follow-on question to that is what is the one thing you find yourself suggesting to people more than anything else about what a next step might be for them? So I retired from doing clients about six years ago, and now I only do readings, well, for a few old clients that I did intuitive strategy for business, which is where I landed in the end, which was fascinating to me. um, But I will say this, will I get what I want? Nice. Good. Yeah. That's what people want. And my, and, and that, that's really the, the, I'm afraid, will I get what I want? Right. And that I'm like, fascinating because how do you know what you want is what's right for you or what's best for you so people come they and and also can you confirm that i'm going to get what i want or can there's, you tell go ahead there's a rolling stone song you can't always that. get what you want <laughs> so my that's how they start talking okay then it's how do i uh get what i want and then it moves into well, how do I surrender to what the universe wants for me? Beautiful. Right. So those Beautiful. three, those are the three levels of what happens when people work with me. It's a or very interesting with- arc when you think about yeah. it, because we're attached to a goal based on our historical perspective of Correct. what's really of value. And this or is available. What, uh, yes. Or, or available. available. And a teacher of mine said the best way to just live in that pure imaginal realm where everything's coming into manifestation all the time is to ask the pure imaginal the pure imaginal realm, what is this higher expression? So the fact that somebody would get to that within well, the context of those were my coaching reading, clients in the end. Yeah, those are the ones, or that join my mastermind now, and you Powerful. know that's that is what we do. We we figure out how do we go. And, and we're really open. It's like, okay, we're going to start here. It's fine. Everybody starts there. And let's go, okay, so if I release fear, well, how do I do that? Because you have to have protocols and you have to help people. There, Like you said, there are stages to this. It doesn't happen overnight. But there is a transformational model that works. Um, certainly, it's worked this way in my work. You know, that's why I have a school. It's why I have a mastermind. It's why I still do the odd business uh, strategy because it's all based on that. Like you think, you know, Um, I have a a program called the spirit of your business, where you actually talk to the spirit of your business, you know, and say like, where do you go with this? And then all of a sudden you're getting all these new ideas where if, is it a construct? Yeah. But you won't access that otherwise. Yeah. And 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 the the idea that the business didn't come from you, it came through you to live in this world and you're raising it to its highest expression. Ask it. Through Ask you, it. that's exactly what I'm teaching now. That's where I. That's where my work is now. Yeah, cool. You know, is to is to get the entrepreneur, for example, into that mindset of like, okay, so I got an inspiration, and I'll say, well, where did you get it from? Because you're obviously not still talking to where you got it from, because you think it's all on your shoulders. But that said, back yes. to what you said, I will say this one thing: everybody has been exposed to sustained uncertainty. Mm-hmm. Everybody right now could use something that like whether it be mind tracks which does a, enable somebody to be invited into that liminal space right the in between you say para liminal right so that those liminal spaces the in between is where all the action is so you have access to that through these recordings that you have i have my oracle that do the same thing so take as many tools as you can like I, these are just tools this is not the end game this is just helping you make decisions and helping you get there and I just do it in a creative way every because I'm also an artist, right? So however way we can help and you 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 that's you you and I do this for a living, but yeah, and don't get too attached to the tool. No, and I, I that's I thing. love that you have 15 different decks. I mean, how oh, cool is I talk that? about oracle abuse too. <laughs> yes. Like oracle abuse. It's like, come on, stop asking. So if I listen to 18 paraliminals today, I said, wait. It's about living your life, not yeah. about listening to more recordings, right? 
<laughs> yeah, like it's it's an interesting thing. But, you know, I personally, I mean, I got a second chance at life. So I feel very blessed and very, you know, that I get to do this. And the fact that I never expected to do this, I never thought this would be what I would be doing. And I'm just doing what spirit leads me to do on a day to day basis. Whether well, the that's world, the world is <laughs> blessed that you have followed that lead. And you too, that you followed yours. Yes, indeed. So and if you know how to shop. <laughs> thanks. <laughs> and so if if there is kind of a final message, is really to follow that, right? To follow where follow, spirit leads. Yeah. Follow where spirit leads and trust. First things first, develop a conscious relationship to a higher power. Whether you call it consciousness, if you if you think the mystical is too woo for you, I don't care what you call it. Just know that there is something greater than you that is that wants to work through you. Why not let it? We're all going to die. <laughs> I'm, I'm between now and then. I want to do something interesting. <laughs> Well, you are doing all kinds of cool stuff. Interesting. Thank you so much for being a part Thank of this. It's you. so good to get to know you. And we'll talk for a thousand more hours. Yes, we will. As soon as we can. Thank Peace you. and blessings. Mwah. Bye for now. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Colette Baron reed you can learn more about Colette at ColetteBaronReed.com. That's C-O-L-E-T-T-E-B-A-R-O-N-R-E-I-D.com. And now in the second part of the podcast, it's just you and me. I'll tell you how to use the paraliminal sessions in the MindTracks app to easily handle obstacles and move toward the success you want especially as it relates to our discussion with Colette. If you're new to the relaxing paraliminal audio sessions, they use breakthrough technologies to activate your whole mind in only 20 minutes to help improve any area of your life. Let's get going. Welcome to the follow-on to my conversation with Colette Baron Reed, an amazing spiritual teacher, publisher of 15 packs of Oracle cards, been sold millions of copies all over the world, 27 languages, seven books, a remarkable woman, a tremendous artist, and a gifted spiritual teacher. Really had a fun time with her, as you may have told, noticed. And I would like to talk about the different ways you could use paraliminal technology to enhance some of the things that she and I were talking about. And I broke the conversation into four different areas. The first is about connecting to your intuitive wisdom, really the basis of all of her work with Oracle cards. The second is about manifesting the life that you desire. Although we talked about that mostly toward the end, it, Really, the whole conversation was around what it is you're choosing to manifest. Number three is this idea of letting go and surrendering. It's a concept that has some important nuanced distinctions. I thought she did a great job of expressing that. And I have some ideas of what you might do around there. And then the fourth area, there was a mention of shifting habits of expectation. I'd like to talk about breaking the habit. She had a life of addiction at one time, over 37 years sober, I think is what she said. And um, oftentimes our addictions are about avoiding the true wisdom and power that's trying to express through us as us. But because we've been trained to marginalize those kinds of thoughts and feelings. We have a tendency to run away from them rather than step into them. And addictions are one of the ways in which we numb ourselves from those deeper messages that are trying to get through. So uh, changing habits is the fourth area that I'd like to talk about. So let's start with the idea of connecting to our intuitive wisdom. Certainly the intuition amplifier, woohoo, 
that's going to be the real big one. Intuition, interestingly, is not necessarily how it appears, but it's the signal that happens just before an intuitive insight appears. It could be a flash visual, you know, a, an image that hits us. It could be a feeling that moves us. It, it um, could be um, an inner voice that speaks to us almost without exception there's some signal just before the one that finally reaches our conscious awareness and intuition amplifier helps to amplify our access to that kind of inner guidance, powerful paraliminal. And based on the pre supposition, the basic operating assumptions of both Colette and I were talking about, you have it, you have profound levels of an intuitive insight. You're just not used to paying attention to it all the time. The second paraliminal I might recommend is called seeing the unseen. I was referring it to it when I was talking about Carl Jung and saying, how do we see the dragon that swallowed us? How do we start to see into the blind spots that our culture has built on our model, our mental model of the world. And the third one, which could be a lot of fun, is play with it at night. It's called dream play. The dreaming mind is a profound resource for spiritual insight. Insight that your, your non-conscious mind is trying to provide to you all the time but for whatever reasons, you're so exhausted when you go to bed or you wake up with an alarm and you immediately are dashing into your life. <clears throat> the dream play paraliminal really changes that. One is the first session of it is about just noticing your regular dreams. And hey, even if you're saying to yourself right now, I never dream, play with it. It's really cool. And the second session is about becoming more lucidly aware of the dream state while you're in the dream dreaming. Because then what you can do is you can actually respond in the dream world. And there's a lot of cool stuff behind the development of this paraliminal. If, you're, if you would like to really have access to that level of insight, what Dr. Stephen LaBerge at the Stanford Sleep Research Laboratory talked about, it is probably the most important resource of personal development that anyone could have because we spend a third of our lives asleep. Why not use it effectively? The second big area that I felt we talked about is about manifesting the life you desire. Certainly the prosperity paraliminal, that's always at the top of the list. You've noticed that. Prosperity Paraliminal. Another one is You Deserve It, which is the one that I did with Lisa, one of the two I did with Lisa Nichols, where you really come to accept that you do deserve the life of your dreams. Very often we are trained by the world that says, what are you so happy about? Why do you think you could do that, right? And so we really want to overcome those messages and recognize you do deserve it. You are worthy of it. You are loved when you have it and you are loved now. And also you do have a will that you can use to get to where you want to go. Um, the third one is called finding treasure. It's a paraliminal that lets you see that, you know, all around you are the resources to help you manifest the life that you desire. You have to be in the inquiry and you have to be awake to the fact that you're always getting those subtle nudges and, and the inner guidance system is always guiding you to recognize it. So we have something within us called the reticular activating system that if you want to see red cars, tell yourself, I'm going to now sort for red cars. And you'll see them on the road all the time. It's just about training your brain to start sorting for all of the resources that will help you get to what you, true, you truly desire to create in your life.
Now, the third area is the idea of letting go and surrendering. And as I said in the podcast, the word surrender means giving up to many people, but we're really talking about something else. We're born into this loving and supportive universe, and we're letting ourselves be held by it. And that's surrendering the efforting to get what we want and recognize it's about receiving the gifts that the universe is constantly giving to us. So surrendering thoughts of lack or limitation may be a part of it. Surrendering the idea that it's all about your effort to make it happen. And deep relaxation is probably the best training mechanism to really let yourself surrender into this present moment and just be held, be held by the surface that you're resting on right now. Very powerful, deep relaxation. And then the euphoria paraliminal, which recognizes that you're always given what you want to live a fully joyous and passionate life. So the euphoria paraliminal really puts you in that place where you can surrender to the greater good that's already yours. And in surrendering to it, you welcome it. Very fun. The fourth area is the idea of changing habits. Now, changing a habit of expectation, like I'm expecting that it should show up this way. And if it doesn't, I haven't really gotten it. We talked quite a bit about that. And it's, it's recognizing that the non-conscious mind, once given what it is that you're intending to create, will find for you the best ways and means to accomplish it. Oftentimes people will say, well, how many times do I need to listen to this parallel before I get what I want? Well, one to three times and your mind says, okay, I got it. I know what you want. I'm working on it. And now we need to get out of the way and let it come, right? Sometimes if we keep push, push, pushing, it's supposed to show up like this. I'm waiting for it to be there and it's not there. It could be tapping us on the shoulder, but we're not noticing. It's as if the answers are there, but we haven't asked the question yet, right? So the changing habits of expectation means understanding what our habits are. And the paraliminal I did called break the habit points out that you can't break a habit. <laughs> It's the opening line of the paralemma. You can only establish a new one. If you have a habit of thinking of pink elephants and I tell you, stop thinking of pink elephants, you're putting energy into thinking of pink elephants. But if I say, think about blue zebras or orange rhinoceri, yeah, you're going to be able to then focus your energy on what you choose instead. And... Um, that's, it's a great paraliminal because it really helps you not only identify what it is you need to stop doing, but it really wires in what it is you're now choosing to start doing. Very cool. Another one is called the new behavior generator. If you want to create a new behavioral repertoire, a new way of doing things, when this happens, I want to have this occur. Great. New Behavior Generator is amazing. It's like a self-development program in a single audio recording. Session A is about reframing your current behaviors and seeing there's a positive intent, even to the things that are getting in your way. Finding a new and creative way to do it is what we're going for. And then think of a role model in session B on that is who is a role model that really models that, demonstrates it, and then creating that as a behavior for your own. It automatically wires it into your ongoing behavioral repertoire. What's so cool about this, like 
many of the changes that occur within you listening to paraliminals, it, it happens as a natural byproduct of just living your life. It's not like there's an effort involved. It's just as suddenly showing up. And very often others are going to notice those changes in you before you notice them within yourself. It's a lot of fun. New behavior generator. It's one of the first I ever developed and still one of the most popular uh, of all of the paraliminals. And the final one in, in terms of changing habit is called self-discipline. Discipline isn't about being a disciplinarian and punishing yourself when you screw up. It's really about being a follower of, a follower of a way of doing or being or having or getting. And that Self-discipline helps you keep your mental focus on what it is you're choosing to create rather than all of the things you may be moving away from. It's been shown that moving away from something negative is a more powerful motivator for many people than establishing a goal and moving toward it. So it is important to recognize that while part of us is moving away from what we don't want, a part of us is moving toward what we do want, it's about getting all those parts of you together as one integrated whole human being choosing to create your life as you desire it to be. I really enjoyed my conversation with Colette Baron reed I hope you enjoyed the two of us together. I'm looking forward to seeing her again at the Transformational Leadership Council. Thanks so much for being a part of this. Thank you for joining me today. I applaud your willingness to maximize your potential. You can easily use the Paraliminal Audio Sessions and the MindTracks app to stimulate your non-conscious mind, that is your inner mind, to reduce any resistance in your life and to propel you toward the success you want. Go to www.mindtracks.com go. That's www.mindtrax.com slash G-O. These amazing audio tools have helped millions, and I encourage you to bring them into your world today. Be sure to be back for more episodes of the Mind Tracks podcast. You'll find insightful conversations with authors, experts, and thought leaders, all devoted to improving your life's experience. Thank you again for being here on our Mind Tracks podcast.